Across the country, ordinary Americans from all walks of life are taking whatever measures necessary to prepare. I'm preparing my family for the total destruction of the power grid. The Yellowstone supervolcano. A financial collapse. And protect themselves. And survival's the goal, it's into the spider hole. Go fast, 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 fast. Go, 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 go. From what they perceive is the fast approaching end of the world as we know it. <laughs> so I'm gonna use like this. <laughs> Next, we go inside the lives of four committed preppers my... who have devised extensive plans. We have enough for about eight people for three years. Gone to great lengths. Well, poison them or cut their throats in their sleep or something like that. And made huge personal sacrifices to ensure their very survival. My knees broke, my back's broke, my hands broke. Uh, uh, the only thing that still works on me is my mouth. The experts will assess their extreme preps and decide if they have what it takes to face Armageddon. Here's to the end of the world. <laughs> and to survive. This is Doomsday Preppers. David Sardi is a disabled truck driver living outside of Nashville, Tennessee. For 20 years, his job took him to every corner of the United States. But now his life's work is at home. He's a prepper. I'm preparing for an electromagnetic pulse that will disable the transportation system of the United States. An electromagnetic pulse, or an EMP, is a sudden burst of energy that can take out any electrical appliance. A nationwide EMP can be caused by a solar flare, a sudden release of energy from the sun. An EMP only takes a millisecond. Your television would go off, the car would stall, all your lights would go out. It would be like somebody instantly flipped a switch on the world. In 1859, an EMP in the form of a solar flare hit the United States and Europe. Nicknamed the Carrington Event, it caused an almost worldwide failure of the telegraph system, one of the few electronic technologies of the day. In some places, it was so powerful, it actually started fires and burnt the wires in two. Could you even imagine what it would do today with all the wires that are strung all over the place? We know that the natural one will happen again. If a similar EMP hit today, scientists believe that it could take over a year to repair America's damaged electrical grid. To stay ahead of the game, David monitors the sun's activity on a daily basis, checking for the warning signs associated with massive solar flares. Yeah, this is where one of those EMP events would come from. This is live right now, the last few days. It's putting out a lot of flares, but right now we're getting a lot of electrical interference. If one of those pops out at Earth, that's when things go bad. Some people think I'm obsessed about prepping, but you know, I hope they're right. I hope they think, I hope I am crazy. I hope nothing happens. You know, that would be the greatest thing in the world. All right, you're gonna lose my eyes, folks. Don't I look cool? A fat Tom Cruise. Spending 20 years on the road as a trucker has given David an insight into just how bad the effects of an EMP would be. The trucking industry is what this country lives on. There's not one thing, one thing that you don't touch, see, hear, and eat that does not come on a truck. All the trucks are computerized, and an electromagnetic pulse would fry the computer in those trucks, just like it would fry the computers in most all your cars. This is the truck computer. Don't look like much. That controls all the stuff for the truck. Without that, this one here wouldn't run at all. It just quit. Gauges in there, fuel sensors. I call it the Achilles heel of the nation's trucking yeah. fleet. Just three days without a working transportation system, would leave America's grocery stores empty. Back at his farm, David adds the shelled corn to his doomsday stores, all stashed for the long term in 208 liter containers. I have enough food and dry grains for one year for seven people. Now this isn't nothing that you're gonna love to eat. It's basically cornbread with beans. 
is. Put these hand warmers in there. They're the same thing as oxygen absorbers. Push out as much air as you can. Hand warmers contain fine iron filings that can absorb oxygen from the air. When placed in a sealed bag, they can eliminate mold and pests that rely on oxygen to survive. 20 years, 30 years, that's good. I'll be pushing up daisies before that goes bad. What David can't store, he plans to grow on his farm, intent on making it the perfect location to sit out doomsday. I'm in a bug out location. We can produce more food than we can eat here. So technically, I have an unlimited supply. So while all of y'all in New York are eating romaine noodles, around here, we're going to be eating a lot of ribeye steak and T-bones. Approximately three days after an electromagnetic pulse, the panic would have done already hit, and most everybody would have cleaned out the grocery stores. Within three weeks, you're going to have the first rioting. Because people, when they get hungry, they're going to try to take other people's food away from them. To stave off hungry masses, David has a three-stage security plan in place. I've got several extra rolls of barbed wire. Then you have these yappy little dogs. If the person has gone through all the trouble to get through the barbed wire and try to take on the dogs, finally, the last line of defense is this. Every gun in this house is loaded. I'm a decent shot. I was a lot better. I used to be able to shoot the wings off a gnat's ass at 100 yards. Get her, dog. Not too bad for a fat guy. David has taken his expertise to the small screen. All right, all you YouTubers. He regularly preaches the prepping gospel to a large online audience. So we're going to pour that into the ceramic filter. He covers everything from water filtration. Dirty water has turned into clean water. To homemade antibiotics. So what I'm going to do is show you how to make your own antibiotics. Thank you very much. Communication is survival for David, and he has no intention of giving it up for an apocalypse. When there's an emergency, the value of communication is fairly basic. I mean, if you don't know where the help is, what good is it going to be? You have to have information to know where it is. All right, KI4LWA, uh, I just wanted to tell you, you picked the right subject about EMP tonight. Congratulations, David. Hello, Nacho. <laughs> Amateur, or ham radio allows David to communicate with millions of other ham operators worldwide. Using only existing radio frequencies in the air, it requires no phone lines, no internet, and can be run completely on battery or solar power. Whiskey Charlie 2 Victor, uh, be back in a few. It's kind of neat to be able to talk to somebody not using any of the infrastructure. It's something I can give back to the community. My knees broke, my back's broke, my hands broke. Uh, uh, the only thing that still works on me is my mouth. That goes a mile a minute. You know, it's like I have a little Briggs and Stratton motor in there. Going, blah, 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 blah. Even though a ham radio would work after an EMP, it still needs to be protected during an EMP. And to keep his prized possession safe, David is building a Faraday cage. A Faraday cage is a metal container that encloses the item completely in a conductive material. By creating a seamless metal surface that electricity would run along but not through, anything inside the Faraday cage would be protected from the electrical surge caused by an EMP. We're not done yet, but this all has to be sealed up, and it's going to be wrapped in metal all the way around. If I was inside, I could close the door, and lightning bolts could strike, and I wouldn't even know they were hitting me. I would probably give it a few days before I even unpacked my radios from their cages. And then I would turn them on and scan the frequencies listening for other amateur radio operators. There are many people that believe that they can just become hermits. And that's fine and dandy. But if you want to rebuild society, you need to communicate. If you don't know where the help is, what good is it going to be? You have to have information to know where it is. 
The consultants at Practical Preppers are impressed by your ability to grow and store food, and your communication systems will help you to build back your community. Yes, one of the reasons I got into amateur radio is for emergency communications. Even though I'm in bad health, there's still things that I can do. As long as I'm here, I'm gonna do my best to help others. But your health is your biggest obstacle to survival. Without the physical strength to tend crops and chop wood, you will need outside help in surviving an EMP. I've been focusing on my health. I've come to a point right now where it's gonna take surgery, but it is what it is. Since the National Geographic special people were filming here, uh, my health has not changed. If anything, it may have got worse. Uh, unless unless I, something happens that I can uh, afford the surgery, uh, I don't have much hope in that. What are the odds of an EMP actually occurring? Extremely rare and unpredictable. Massive solar storms happen about every 150 years. Carrington-sized events, which could take years to recover from, happen every 500 years or so. In the Salt Lake City suburb of Orem, Utah, Colleen Bishop has earned a reputation for being able to whip up gourmet cuisine in a flash. And what the bubbly housewife is also known for is... I am preparing for a financial collapse, which will result in the end of the world as we know it. I believe that there will be a colossal financial collapse. I believe we're on the precipice of that right now. The mortgage industry, the currency value, Wall Street, unemployment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's, it's all going to come into play as the perfect storm. We have a great deal of foreign debt that could be turned over and flooded back into the system at any time. There will be a day of reckoning, and when that happens, the financial collapse will take a matter of hours before it impacts us right here in this nation. I used to run a multi-million dollar business. I had my bling that my husband gave me every Christmas. Now the kind of bling that I asked Santa Claus for is typically the type of bling you'll see on a pressure cooker or a solar oven. If we find ourselves in a world where there's been a financial collapse, and it's very likely grocery stores will be empty. I think I might be eating a little differently than other preppers because I'm a foodie. Everything I have, I have for full flavor and gourmet foods. If the world comes to an end, I may be eating rice and beans, but they will be some kicking rice and beans. I'll be eating more things like beef stroganoff, chicken papacy casserole, cocoa van, four cheese Italian risotto. I'll be eating some good stuff. Under a doomsday scenario, I'll be the only one standing there who has another 100 pounds to lose. Everybody else will be skin and bones. <laughs> so what are we looking at then? Wheat-wise? Oh, we've probably got uh, about 3,000 pounds between the two of us, something like Colleen that. Colleen and her husband, Scott, foresee a day when money is so worthless that fuel and groceries become luxury items. Cocoa has gone up 300% since last Christmas. My worst case scenario is the value of the dollar is brought down to four cents. Can you believe these were 25 cents? To prepare for a society where a carton of milk might become prohibitively expensive, Colleen and her husband spend six to eight hours a day prepping and stockpiling enough food and water to last them for years. This is where we store all of our yummy freeze-dried and dehydrated foods. Just this closet alone, we have enough for about eight people for three years. A protein room. We're running out of room for the canned chicken. This one won't fit. Uh, there's meat stored all over the place. <laughs> it's like, oh, excuse me, don't step on the meat. A modified guest bedroom. Eight 55-gallon barrels of water. What have oh, you no. done to my guest bedroom, honey? It's a water bed. <laughs> no, I'm not getting up on there. And a comfort room. So a lot of people think that this room is a little bit overkill. This is where I store all the comforts, such as chocolate, brownie mixes, and toilet paper. All of our preparedness supplies that we have in the home presently um, probably have a retail value of over $100,000. Just so you know, I tallied the milk, and we're, we're looking at 700 gallons, but I really want that to be up to 900. I think they've got a sale coming up on that, too, so now would be a good time for that. It's the only time. <laughs> My wife does like to store a lot of food. I'm grateful for a wife that likes to and is good at cooking. Okay. 
It's something that gives you an edge in a doomsday scenario. I might add just a couple pats of butter, because butter always makes uh, the sauce. The fact of the matter is, is I'd go back into a burning house for my cookbooks. I watch a lot of cooking shows in order to give me great inspiration for gourmet dishes from shelf-stable foods. It is not tough to make gourmet menus out of shelf-stable foods. The only tricky part is knowing how to make a food shelf-stable. Colleen fears that electricity costs will skyrocket, and she won't be able to rely on her refrigerator. Consequently, she treats her perishable foods so they will stay fresh for years. So we're actually preserving eggs. Today she is teaching her friend Barb food preservation tricks. Put a little bit of mineral oil on your hands and then slather it all over the egg, which is basically mimicking how they already come out of the hen, not allowing oxygen to get through. This goes fast. It does. When I get a killer deal on eggs, like 50 cents or 75 cents a dozen, I can buy a whole lot of them and I can store them in a cool, dry place without them going bad. They will sit tight for about uh, nine to 12 months. There we go. So I'm actually dipping hot cheese wax over hard cheeses. All you do is just dip it in here nice and easy. They continue to age, but you don't have to have refrigeration. And these will keep for 20 to 25 years. That's great. In the event of a financial collapse, I suspect that a lot of people are gonna have to just eat that nasty powdered stuff. Mm -mm, not me. I am having Swiss cheese on homemade non bread. <laughs> there, we're running out of room in here, hon. <laughs> a fortified pantry isn't Colleen's only defense against a catastrophic financial collapse. If her fears are realized, she's prepared to fight back. So you're never more than 20 feet away from a firearm in this house. One example is a small firearm and a number 10 can of peas. And I remember that because it's my pea shooter. <laughs> so this is my everyday kind of weapon. They don't make uh, cans quite big enough for my doomsday weapons. And we get all the peas off. And it's not about protecting your food. It's about protecting your life, your comfort, and even your virtue. My husband and I focus a great deal on what we call our bug-in plan, where things are so awful outside that you really don't want to go anywhere. In a doomsday financial collapse scenario, we would be staying put exactly where we are. Tonight, the bishops practice sweeping the house for intruders who may attempt to loot their food supplies. Being able to walk through your home without the lights on, which you may not have, is critical. Knowing the layout of your home gives you a significant advantage. I navigate this house in the dark even better than I navigate my own town with a GPS system. We feel confident that we could take care of any potential invader. We chose Morse code as one of our communication strategies because we were watching one of the Charlie Angels movies, and they're like doing Morse code on each other's hands in the dark so that they know what their next kick butt move is. Anyway, so we thought that would be a good idea, so we started using that. I think having the alternative communication measures will be very important. You don't always want to turn your hand, and the element of surprise is one of the biggest assets that you have. We want to have more than one communication means, and so another strategy is learning to be fluent in Tagalog. Hindi. They speak Tagalog in the Philippines. It is a rare language, so it's not likely um, that we run into someone who will be fluent in that as well. I think there are a lot of people that would think that the extent that my wife and I go to is probably, let's say, insane. That will change, certainly, in a doomsday scenario. If society crumbles, <laughs> Colleen and Scott plan on being a resource for others. Ow! But they won't be able to defend everyone. What we're gonna do so it's right behind the Adam's apple. So instead, they are teaching their community how to survive. Colleen is so passionate about the importance of self-defense, she has left her corporate job to teach ordinary housewives how to protect themselves. She provides hands-on training, including a quick-draw shooting class for women. 
We'll have women coming in having never even fired a gun before, and we will be able to teach them this skill by the end of our class. You should just see their faces. It makes such a difference for them to know that they can take care of themselves. The quick draw is a self-defense technique. You don't have time to say, oh, Mr. Bad Guy, will you please get in my line of sight? You're going to breathe in, and then you're going to breathe out as you extend. Out. There you go. And then you do the dance. <laughs> and if she runs out of bullets, she is also an expert in self-defense. History has shown us again and again and again that when the society collapses, then you have great amounts of violence, specifically targeting women. The first mistake they will make is to underestimate your ability to fight back. I push my foot up to the ceiling. I don't need to be strong. Women that actually take the time to learn this technique, they have mentally empowered themselves so that they actually have a better chance of avoiding rape. Okay, right, exactly. So it's right behind the Adam's apple. Are you allowed to hurt, maim, or kill someone who wants to rape you? Yes. Okay, awesome. You want to dig your thumbs in to his eyes. Please don't pull out my husband's eyes, okay? Okay? This will crack or crush bone. You want a top to bottom strike. All right, so that wraps up our training for today. In the interest of strengthening our preparedness community so that we can all be safe and strong, I'm inviting you over to my house this evening for a fabulous dinner party. I am so excited about tonight's dinner party. I'm not going to make a single dish with anything from the refrigerator or from the freezer. Woo! Perky, fabulous. I don't think most people would think of this as doomsday cooking. She's fabulous. Colleen and Scott are the star preppers in my estimation. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to this evening's Preparedness Pro dinner party. Everything you can make from shelf stable food. I don't want you to ever think of food storage and curl up your, your lip like ever again, <laughs> OK? Wow, this is amazing. So, I've never had a deviled egg with almonds before. These must be salmon cakes, right? How old are these eggs? They're about seven, eight months. Wow. So I'll do this and tell my kids at Thanksgiving that they're nine-month-old eggs. There I'll you die. go. Here's to eating well at the end of the world. Cheers. 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 The experts have concluded that your food storage is excellent and commend you for developing a varied cooking plan <laughs> and for sharing this knowledge with your community. Your self-defense strategies will also serve you well in case of a societal breakdown due to economic collapse. It is likely that others will look to you for help in dangerous times. We expect people to turn to us in times of crisis in a doomsday type scenario. And we're not naive. We are prepared for both type of people who might want to come. <laughs> However, while your stored water is a good start, it is inadequate for a long-term bug-in. <laughs> you can only survive three days without water. At the bare minimum, we recommend you install a rain-catching system so you can replenish your water supply. Um, I'd say we've covered that bare minimum several times over, haven't we? Backups to backups. Yep. We don't necessarily reveal all our cards. <laughs> Since um, we wrapped up the show, um, we have added to those reserves, both in terms of water and in terms of options for fuel and power. Uh, so I think we're sitting just fine, and the changes that we will make will be done because of our continual efforts in preparedness. What are the odds of a financial collapse actually occurring? While hyperinflation and severe depressions have occurred in major economies in the past, most economists do not believe the United States is currently at risk. Kathy Harrison is a New England liberal living the idyllic country life. She plays soccer with her kids, cooks homemade meals for her family, and loves to garden. Except... They call me the Doris Day of Doom because I'm preparing for a black swan event like a catastrophic New Madrid earthquake.
Black Swan events are those events that come out of nowhere. We often say, oh, I didn't see that one coming, but they have the potential to completely change the way we live our lives. Kathy thinks the next Black Swan will come in the form of a catastrophic earthquake along the 200 kilometer long New Madrid seismic zone in the central United States. The New Madrid fault covers seven states. It has actually let go twice before. There was a big earthquake um, in 1811. From December 1811 to March 1812, there were thousands of quakes in the New Madrid zone, including around 20 that were magnitude 6.5 or larger. Now things would be totally different. We have major cities on that fault zone. We have nuclear power plants. We have communications that have to cross that. It would effectively cut our country into two pieces. Millions of trucks cross the New Madrid seismic zone every year, carrying food and other supplies. If the truck stopped running, we'd be out of food in three days. I'm prepared for that. We have chosen a place to live that can be fairly self-sufficient in terms of food, water, and heat. We have enough carrots here, we could probably <laughs> feed the whole neighborhood. Kathy and her husband, Bruce, grow most of their family's food in their backyard. I am the supporter of the Doris Day of Doom. Would you think about adding more of those currants scattered in with the flowers? That might be a good idea. I wouldn't say prepping is an obsession. I would say it's just the way we live. We're growing kale and peppers. All of these tomatoes regrew from seed that we saved from our tomatoes from last year. I never have to worry about buying seed. If there's ever a supply disruption, I'm good. We grow a lot of tomatoes. I probably put up about 100 jars of sauce a year. Tomatoes aren't the only things that Kathy preserves in a jar. In fact, she pretty much cans everything in sight. I probably have 700 cans down in the basement. I have several kinds of meat, chicken, ground beef, stew beef, peaches and pears and beautiful cherries. During canning season, I can easily spend six or eight hours a day over my canner. All righty. Here we go. There you go. Oh, here it's comes the steam. Hot. Look at them boiling. There you go. This is local grass-fed beef. This meat will stay good in this jar pretty much indefinitely. If we have a power outage and our freezers are down and everything, this is already cooked. I just have to heat it up, and it's a meal. I could actually even eat a cold out of the jar if I wanted to. In a magnitude 7.7 .7 New Madrid quake, it is estimated that over 2,000 electric, oil, and natural gas facilities would be damaged, leaving millions across the country without power. I think we um, think about electricity and it's this magic stuff that's sort of always there. But think about what happens when it's not always there. You can't pump gas. You can't purchase groceries. You can't access money from your bank account. If power goes down, Kathy and Bruce have prepared a plan B, a way to trade and barter for the goods they need without money. You can't eat gold and you can't eat silver. Instead, we have a number of things that we could barter if we wanted to. You want to smoke them? You want to take the top off? Bees have provided us with honey for um, thousands of years. There was honey found in the tombs of Egypt. And the smoke keeps these nice and docile. They'll stay right in here and behave themselves. If I came down here without smoking and opened these hives, they'd have been all over us. They'd been really angry. Honey could become very valuable. It's one of the only foods that won't go bad. You can store it forever and ever and ever and ever. Oh. Ah, that's perfect. Delicious. In a grid down situation, those bees become not just food for us, but they become honey that we can barter for. They become candles. They provide us with a base for salves and creams for uh, wounds or sores. Those bees are the essence of resilience for us. Kathy and Bruce are also building up a bank of skills that will give them complete independence from mainstream society. My husband does the woodworking. I like to sew. Get in the and rhythm. Don't go too fast. Get in the rhythm. All right, all right, all right. We got it. With wheat, I can grind it and turn it into good bread for my family. Do you have muscles? Can you do this? Yes. I'll need and you need. Oh, look it, I think I got it. I can chop wood. Almost, you're getting it. I'm also thinking about who around me has a skill that I maybe don't have so that we learn to depend on each other. Kathy actively encourages her entire community to ready themselves for the coming doomsday 
by including them in her prepping activities. We're already in a sort of doomsday event. I mean, the, like, is hitting the fan around us. Do you want me to do that? Yeah. Our government is spending like hundreds of billions of dollars a year on weapons and the military. Like, it seems like they're prepping. We've been very busy out collecting apples for doing our cider pressing. How this process works is you throw them into this hopper and it grinds them. You just keep turning and turning and turning. You see the cider comes out the bottom here. After the cider has sat for a while, you, it will, um, you can turn it into hard cider or whiskey. If a crisis happened, we could barter. It would be very, very valuable. Let me see how it is. It's easy to feel a little left out of the prepper community if you live in New England and if you're not um, fairly right-wing and conservative politically. But I just don't spend my time worrying about storing guns and ammunition. I think we're going to get all this done today. Because our security comes not from stockpiling weapons, but from having a community that respects each other, supports each other, and we have each other's backs. Keep loading, keep loading. Some people say, oh, I just want to have guns. And frankly, I think that's pretty stupid. Marauding bands come, I'll show them how much great food I've got, I'll invite them to some sort of feast and charm them, and then if I decide that they could be useful and cooperative, great. And otherwise, I'll poison them or cut their throats in their sleep or something like that. We have become a nation that expects to be taken care of. We think that there is always going to be some white knight and a horse that comes in to, to rescue us. And more and more often, we're seeing that that just is not the case. Hello, dear. I suppose that there are some people who do, in fact, think that I'm paranoid and gloomy, doomy, and why do I waste my time thinking about this? But here's the reality. Because I've spent a lot of time preparing for the worst case scenario, I can afford to be cheerful the rest of the time. Que sera, sera to the end of the world. <laughs> By growing and preserving your own food, you have given yourself the ability to survive without normal infrastructure for many years. Yeah, yeah I think so. I think we've got enough to really take care of ourselves and our extended family. Yeah, our, I feel yeah, good about yeah. it. You are well-rounded and self-sufficient in community-based skills. But in a true nationwide disaster, there is likely to be widespread lawlessness. Well, it's... um. I'm really not worried about that. I, I, we have a wonderful community that we can fall on to support. You need to think about how you can secure your location and learn to protect your family with weapons that you feel comfortable using. It's a place we rarely fall down. There's no question about it. It just doesn't really suit ethically who we are. It's been a few weeks since Nat Geo was here to visit, and we listened to what they had to say, but we've decided not to change the way we prepare. At the end of the day, the people who stock up on guns and the people who support resilient communities can get together, exchange notes, and we'll decide who fares the best. What are the odds of a new Madrid earthquake actually occurring? The past three were about 500 years apart, but every 50 years, there's a one in 50 chance the big one will hit. <laughs> Dennis Evers is a prop maker and inventor who lives on a Colorado ranch. Like a typical family man, he spends time with his kids, grandkids, and works to maintain the farm. Except... I'm prepping to protect my family from global chaos brought on by hyperinflation. As far as what I see on the horizon for this country uh, are some pretty tough times, and I believe it's going to be a, a fairly protracted uh, event. The cause is the government printing trillions of dollars when we don't have it to back it up. If the economy collapses, I see a tremendous shockwave going through our entire society. Uh, there are going to be a lot of hungry people. There are going to be a lot of angry people. I'm concerned about how my family will survive in a world where food and basic needs are going to be outrageously priced. If things go bad and the economy tanks, we're ready for it. It's not going to be a surprise. We're not going to sit around like millions of Americans wondering what happened or how it happened. We're simply going to spring into action and survive. 
When it hits the fan, each of my kids has a job and an assignment, and they know what to do and how to do it. My oldest son, Tim, is in charge of hunting and security. My daughter, Jenny, and her husband, Pat, are in charge of fuel. Nate and Betsy deal with communications. Ricky knows how to weld and helps me with engineering side of things. Johnny's currently training to be an emergency responder. Dennis believes that civilization will devolve into a harsh dog-eat-dog -dog world once extreme hyperinflation hits. He and his wife, Sandy, have stored buckets of provisions and continue to build up their stocks by preserving massive quantities of foodstuffs. As far as feeding your family, canning is probably one of the best things there is, and we've done it for years. Sandy's in charge of food, and she'll spend days processing hundreds of quarts of fruit, and it all entails a tremendous amount of work. I spend all day canning. There's days where all you do is get up in the morning and start canning and, and until you go to bed at night. People might think what I do is excessive, but for our application, it's not even as much as I'd like to do. All right, we finished this bushel of peaches, and it made 21 quarts. These jarred peaches will last for years. When we're done with the canning, we need a place to put it, and that's under the beds. So what I've done is basically remove the box springs and put boxes of canned goods. You're not supposed to stack the jars on top of each other because it could break the seal. So that's a lot. When you do hundreds and hundreds of jars, it takes up a lot of space. So underneath the bed is perfect. It stays cool, out of the way. Nobody messes with it. Canning is only one of the three labor-intensive methods used to make large quantities of food last from six months to a year. Vacuum-sealed jars to preserve fruit a homemade smoker to preserve meat, and a solar dehydrator that Dennis invented and constructed from scraps, which can be used to preserve either. We've invented some things here at the ranch that help feed the kids almost no cost whatsoever. One of them is a solar dehydrator. The solar dehydrator operates by using only the energy from the sun's rays. A bounty of fruit from the ranch is ingeniously prepared by Dennis, and at the end of the process, the solar dehydrator yields pounds and pounds of long-lasting food. This will help me feed my family when disaster hits by having a, an abundant amount of food available that really doesn't cost anything other than the sun. The importance of delegating labor when uh, it hits the fan is no person can do everything. I can only be so many places at, at one time. Pat and Jenny are my fuel guys, and uh, they take care of our wood needs. Yeah. Growing up in my family, my dad taught us kids all many different capabilities that would enable us to be more self-sufficient. Firewood is a common fuel choice for many preppers because of its easy availability. So in order to be ready for hyperinflation, the Evers routinely stock their wood pile. We have a lot of implements around the ranch here, and one of them is Kong, which is a uh, homemade log splitter, which we built for absolutely nothing. Pat and Jenny use Kong a lot because it uh, allows them to process a tremendous amount of wood in a reasonable amount of time. If the economy tanked and we had a stockpile of our fuel, which the boys are cutting right now, we'd be able to keep the house warm, we'd be able to cook food, boil water, and maintain some of the essentials that people find comforting and often take for granted. Dennis believes the economy will crumble and cause vital infrastructure, public works, and homes to fall into disrepair. In order to maintain their ranch's infrastructure, Dennis has trained one of his kids in a skill that might be in short supply. My dad taught me pretty much everything. I have woodworking, metal, plumbing, electrical. The economy had collapsed. Any skill is a good skill, especially metalworking. It's dirty, it's long lasting. It's just, it's a good skill to know. Ricky's a really good uh, craftsperson. She's capable of metalwork and woodwork. And if I need help on my uh, creations or uh, if we need to maintain them or build a part, uh, Ricky's got the capability to do it. She's there for me and she knows what to do. Dennis believes that if hyperinflation occurs, destructive, life-threatening situations will be inescapable. Colorado had close to 3,500 fires in 2010. So one of Dennis's youngest sons has taken on the brave responsibility of safeguarding the family. Johnny's in fire training right now to become a fireman, which will be a nice addition to have around in the event the stuff hits the fan. Dennis and Johnny know that in order to be ready, Johnny's training cannot stop when he leaves the firehouse. Ready, set, go. 15 seconds. Push it. 
Okay, Johnny, hurry up. Coming on 45 seconds. Let's get going. Coming on a minute, buddy. Finish it up. Where was that? 2.15. You gotta be kidding me. Yep. You're supposed to have it in under a minute 30. So I screwed up pretty big. The Evers Emergency Food and Water Supply far surpasses FEMA's three-day recommendation for general disaster preparedness, so they fear they will become a target during an economic collapse. Dennis has taken a more preventative approach to ensuring their safety. Nate and Betsy are my tech team, and uh, they're helping us install security and communication devices here at the ranch. We're the gizmo couple, and our job is to deliver IT to the family, and that's what we do. So essentially what we're doing here is we're setting up a, a security system for motion detection. We can place it anywhere we'd like, you know, a driveway, a, a, a Probably. porch. So for instance, right now what we're trying to do is see what the distance on this device is. So you want to try it right here? Bones, are you ready? Yeah. How's the signal? Perfect. What's that? 100 feet? At least. Yeah. It's working good. But if intruders were able to infiltrate the Evers compound, Dennis's son, Tim, has been tasked with the crucial duty of internal security. Tim's a pretty good hunter, and he's also the kind of kid that thinks outside the box, uh, building bows and arrows, throwing tools. Timmy will be using his unique skills in the event the stuff hits the fan. Tim has followed in his father's inventor footsteps and has found alternative uses for commonplace construction items. PVC piping is ordinarily used in plumbing, but Tim has uncovered a more defensive use. OK, I'm going to make a bow out of PVC. The PVC has to be cut between 4 feet and 5 feet for your bow. You have to tape the fiberglass rod. Otherwise, it will crack and split. If the economy collapsed, you could use this bow to hunt small game. Kitty cats, dogs, rats, pigeons, squirrels, doves and all that. The bow would be great for security because it's quiet. You wouldn't know where the shot came from. If the arrow came out, the broadhead would stay in, continuing to move around and may cause massive hemorrhaging, which is bleeding to death. Most families get together for fun, but for this prepper family, practice makes perfect. So every Wednesday, the Evers convene at the ranch to discuss, among other things, their survival plan. <laughs> Family night also gives us a chance to check on other people's preps just to see how they're doing. Who can go get wood, like, maybe next weekend or something? Amy called. She has some cedar, but there's also a bunch of old aspen and pine growth that they're trying to clear out. The people that are going to survive when it hits the fan are people that have expected it, have prepared for it, have trained for it. Listen, bring it here, we'll use Kong, we'll split it, we could knock it out in two events. And I believe they could survive any catastrophe that's thrown their way. I told you, all you kids, that bottom line is, if it hits the fan, we need to uh, just come together as a family and look out for you guys and look out for anybody else that needs our help. It's just gonna get really ugly and it's gonna be basically uh, every man for himself scenario. Yeah, I agree. I know when it comes, we'll all come together here and survive as a family. Well, that's all we can do. Dennis, if, as you predicted, extreme hyperinflation causes global chaos in your lifetime, your innovative food storage and preparation methods will allow you and your family to eat for up to six months in an economic meltdown. Also, the wide range of skills among your family members will enable you to brave a disaster situation. I'm okay with both those assessments. However, you have a limited supply of fuel. The experts recommend you store more fuel to survive a catastrophic event for an extended period of time. I don't agree with that. I mean, if we run out of propane, there's more than enough wood to last a really long time. We all have the skills to harvest and process wood for fuel. <laughs> It's been about a month since we uh, received the critique from your uh, specialist. They're, they're spot on. Yeah, we need more fuel. Even in order to bring in firewood, we need fuel. So it's just right now, it's too expensive. We'll have to deal with that. What are the odds of hyperinflation actually occurring? While hyperinflation and severe depressions have occurred in major economies in the past, most economists do not believe the United States is currently at risk. 